Please turn with me to the Gospel according to Matthew and to chapter 6 and this passage that gives us some of the Lord's teaching on the most important and precious matter of prayer. In Matthew chapter 6 and just reading from verse 9. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for ever. Amen. Now we come to the petition that we have at verse 11 this morning. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. There's a message to us in this petition before we go any further with this. And the message to us is that we are dependent upon God for all things. Give us this day our daily bread. And the meaning partly is this, that if God does not give, we do not have. He's the giver of every good and perfect gift. If God does not give, we do not have. God has the right and the power to grant the harvest. He has the power to make it abundant. He has the power to make it small. Or he has the power to blight the harvest to such an extent that there is no harvest at all. And it's all in the prerogative will of God. The sun and the rain are at his command. Now, we read from Psalm 104 a little while ago in the earlier part of the service. And I made the point before we began to read the psalm to notice just how it clearly states that in so many respects, even the, with the wildlife and men, all creatures upon the earth are dependent upon what God does in making provision for them, for their lives in the world. I just read again from verse 14 of that psalm. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle. So, no grass, no food for the cattle, And where do you go from there? No meat, no milk, no dairy products, no butter for your toast in the morning, all these kinds of things, you see? God makes the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man, in in other words, the, the vegetables and so forth that we are given to eat in the course of our lives, that he may bring forth food out of the earth. And the simple point at the beginning of the message this morning is that if God does not give, we do not have. We tend to be, I would suggest to you, very presumptuous in our time. We go along to the supermarket and we expect everything to be there, don't we? We just expect all the products that we have on our list, assuming we take a list, we expect it all to be there. And not only that, but all the brands that we expect to be there. I wonder how many people today, I don't wish to be impertinent here, but I wonder how many people today, when you go to the, to the chiller aisles and you see the packs of chicken and the pre-prepared or processed food that's available there, how many people pause to think that that very sort of sanitised packet of meat or, or processed food came from an animal? And that the animal lived in barns or the animal lived in fields and that someone had to care for that animal and then someday it got slaughtered and the meat was processed and brought to the supermarket that Mr. Smith on a Tuesday morning could go to the supermarket and find exactly what he hoped to find there. How much do we trace things back to the process 
of putting food in the supermarket. And how far do we go back in that process? Do we not link everything back to God? He is the giver of every good and perfect gift. You go to another aisle and you, you pick up a packet of breakfast cereal, your porridge or your cornflakes or whatever it might be, and there it is in a, in a very attractively packaged cardboard box and uh, everything is designed to draw your eye to the box and what's inside? The cereal that you put in your bowl and on which you pour your milk in the morning. But where did that come from? Who stops to think about where that came from? All the fields that are in our country today with the, with the corn and the wheat and everything growing there. Do we think that, or do we pause to think that what we take off the shelf came from that? And how did that grow? Because God sent the sun and the rain and God, by one means or another, has preserved the crop from pest and disease and all the rest of it. You link what we have in our bowls in the morning to what God has provided for in the first place. We can become very presumptuous and very forgetful. And so this is a very apposite kind of prayer, isn't it? Give us this day our daily bread. It all in the end comes from God. We must come, according to this direction for prayer, to ask for our daily bread. And that prayer in itself recognises our utter dependency upon God. Not the supermarket, not the economic situation of the country, not all of those things, but upon God. That's where our minds finally rest. Give us, we say to the Lord, give us this day our daily bread. So it recognises our dependency and it humbles us in that kind of way and it honours God, does this part of the prayer, as the giver of all good gifts. Now I want to apply this portion of the prayer in two ways this morning. First of all, in the most obvious and literal sense, food for the body, give us this day our daily bread, but also in the spiritual sense. Because just as if God does not give, we do not have in the ordinary material realm, so also in the spiritual sense. If God does not save, we remain lost. If God had not given his Son to be our Saviour, we would have no hope. If God does not plant faith in our hearts, we remain without a Saviour. If God does not uphold us day by day in our spiritual life, we fall away. We need the bread of God in both senses, in the ordinary and obvious sense, but also in the spiritual sense. So I'm going to apply the prayer in those two ways. First of all, then, the literal sense. The prayer is for the provision of our daily needs. Give us this day our daily bread. Well, bread, certainly in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ upon earth, and even today, bread is a staple diet. It stands really, though, for any kind of food, but especially for the essential food that we need. Give us this day our daily bread, not luxuries, but bread. That food that will keep us alive and well and healthy and strong. There's a prayer that's recorded in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 8. You may know it. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. And the word there means suitable. Lest I be full and deny thee. In other words, if you give me too much, I will forget all about you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Now that's the prayer of someone who knows his own spiritual vulnerability. If he has too much, he's liable to forget God. If he has too little, he's liable to forget God and take things into his own hands and go about stealing. Give us this day our daily bread. Give me what's right for me. Give me what's enough for me. Don't give me too much that I may forget God. Don't give me too little that I may despair and go off 
and fall into sinful ways. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. That very much and very clearly implies that this and the whole of the prayer is a daily prayer. Give us this day. This is not a prayer, give us today and tomorrow and the rest of the week. Give us this day our daily bread. A daily prayer for daily needs. The question has often been put, that, well, when you've got statements in the scriptures that, that tell us, well, well, God knows what we need, and people say, well, if God knows what we need, why do we have to keep humming and asking him for, for what we need? And people make that kind of a comment. Why can't we just pray once? Lord, give me what I need for the rest of my life. Well, supposing that's how we prayed. Supposing we prayed, Lord, forgive me for my sin. And that was the only time we ever prayed a conf confessionary kind of prayer like that. Lord, bless the church. And we just prayed it once. Where does God fit into our scheme of things? Where does he fit in? But you see, coming daily, God very much fits into the centre of our scheme of things. We don't forget him. We're always reminding ourselves that we're reliant upon him. We're always dependent upon the God of heaven for every conceivable need that we have. A prayer like this, an instruction in prayer like this, keeps us in fellowship with the Lord. And that's the all-important thing for many reasons. Now, to develop this a little bit more, give us this day our daily bread, reminds us that God has appointed means of obtaining our daily bread. Remember that when Israel was in the wilderness, uh, there was no food and the people complained and uh, they did a lot of that. They, were, they developed the habit of complaining a great deal in the wilderness. There's no food, there's no water, there's nothing for us here. Why have you brought us out here into the wilderness to die? And God gave them manna. And God sent the manna down every morning, six days a week. And yet, God didn't send it down into their dwelling places. They had to go out and to gather it. And there's a principle that applies right through the scriptures. Give us this day our daily bread. Do we expect it to suddenly and miraculously appear in the fridge or in the cupboard, on the plate? No. There are means whereby our daily bread is to be obtained. Just as it was for Israel, so is it to be for us all. Now, the God, God's way of providing in that sense, the means whereby we're provided for, is of course our own labour. Remember the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's God's day. But it also goes on to say, six days shalt thou labour and do all thy work. In other words, there's a kind of a double edge to that commandment. Keep this Lord's day, keep the Sabbath day holy unto the Lord, but for the rest of the week shalt thou labour and do all thy work. So we're to be a labouring people, a working people. And that's the means that God has ordained for the supply of our food and of our temporal needs. In Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, he draws attention to the fact that it seems to have been people that were so taken up with the, the Lord's return that they weren't bothering to, to live as they should. And one of the, the problems that there was there that, that were people were becoming lazy and they were becoming dependent upon other people. And he says to them um, at one point, when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. In other words, if anybody is not going to make any effort to labour, if people are going to be dependent upon others when they could work, then they shouldn't 
eat. That's a very severe kind of thing to say, isn't it? But it's a kind of it's a disciplinary kind of verse. Now there are, are obviously all kinds of reasons why it is not possible for some people to work. Age is an issue, and some of us here will know all about that. Or the health matters that obstruct us from working. Or there may not be work that we can get. Now we know all about all of these things, but if a man would not work, if he has not the will to work, if he's not prepared to work, then he should not eat, says the Apostle Paul. Now, I'm saying all of this because if that's the means whereby we're to provide for ourselves, doesn't this prayer therefore include this aspect? That if God would require me to work for my daily bread, then Lord, give me strength to labour. Give me the health to do it. Give me the opportunity for it. And give me success in my labour. You see, there's this, this many aspects of a prayer like this that we have to take in, into account. The manna fell down from heaven because God sent it in that miraculous way. But when the people of Israel got into Canaan, it was all different. There was no manna in Canaan. There were no quails suddenly appearing. There was no water that gushed out of the rock when Moses spoke to it or, or, or smote it with his rod. They had to look for it. They had to dig the wells and, and take over these things. There was labour there. And we need to understand that this is God's way for us and therefore we're to, to pray in that respect for our daily bread and the means of obtaining it. Now a third way of thinking about this, of course, and it leads us into this inevitably, is that as God provides our daily bread, let us not be slow in giving him our thanksgiving. When in John chapter 6, the Lord Jesus fed that enormous crowd of people with five loaves and two fishes, before he distributed the food to the disciples and the disciples to the crowd, we read that he gave thanks. That's a remarkable thing, isn't it? You imagine him standing there with five loaves. Don't think of a loaf that you go and get from the supermarket. Nothing like that at all. Little, little cakes, little flat things and that someone would take for a picnic and a couple of fish. And there he is standing there, 5,000 men and possibly others beside, and he gives thanks to his heavenly Father for all this that is miraculously going to not only feed 5,000, but more left over at the end that he began with. And he paused to give thanks. Do we pause to give thanks? You know, as I thought about this, I wonder to myself whether this isn't one of the most neglected prayers in all of Christendom. Give us this day our daily bread. When did you last pray a prayer like that? When do we pause to think that all things come from God? That if God does not give, we do not have. I'm sure that we would pause to give thanks unto God for the food that's already on the plate, on the table that's before us. And so we should, following the pattern of our Lord Jesus Christ. But preceding that is, give us this day our daily bread, and then when it's there, thank the Lord for it. Thank the Lord for the variety that we have. Ever think about it in that way? When the people of Israel were in the wilderness, it was manna and quail all the time. 40 years. Manna and quail, manna and quail, manna and quail. When John the Baptist was in the wilderness, he lived off locusts and wild honey. Not much of a diet, not much variety there. Well, God has blessed us enormously. We're not to live off manna and quail or locusts and wild honey day after day after day after day. We've got a rich abundance of variety available to us. And you can take all of those ingredients and you can cook them in so many different ways and spice them up or put herbs in and it enhances, doesn't it, all the wonderful things that we can have and enjoy. And why is it? But because God has given us 
such richness of variety in our daily living. Be thankful for it. I've been to places in the earth where people are just glad to have anything. Anything. And here we are in Western Europe and we complain if our favourite brand of cereal isn't there on the, packet, on, on the shelf. And that's the kind of society that we've degenerated into, really. But be thankful for the provisions of the Lord. But then a fourth thing in this same, under this same heading, our daily bread in the ordinary, literal kind of way. What is that for? What does that bread do? What does that food do? Well, it nourishes our bodies. It keeps us healthy so far as health depends upon food. It gives us strength for daily life. But lead on from there, and the next question is, what is life for? Why are we here? Why do we want to be fed? Why do we want to be not only free from hunger, why do we want to be able to go about and and do our business day by day and live healthy, strong lives? Why do we want to do that? Do we want to do that just so that we can indulge ourselves in whatever we feel like doing? Or is there a higher purpose? Is there a higher reason for living? Aren't we here to live to the honour and the glory of God? Remember Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 5. He, Christ, died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. That's why we're here. That's why God has saved you. If you're a Christian this morning, that's why God has saved you. Not just to wander through life until we get to the end, but to live to the honour and the praise of God. To be in his service. To live for him. To offer to him service that is meaningful and pleasing in his sight. There's a hymn written by one of the old divines, Philip Doddridge, begins with the words, My gracious God, I own thy right to every service I can pay. And later on in that hymn, he writes these words, and they're very scriptural. What is my being but for thee? It's sure support, it's noblest end. He puts it so succinctly there. Why am I here? What is my being if it's not for thee? It's sure support. It's God who supports our life. It's God who provides our daily bread and keeps us in that sense. And its noblest end, the purpose and the end of our lives in this world. Give us this day our daily bread that we may go on to be true servants of the Lord. And fifthly, under this same heading before I move on to to the last part, don't forget others. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, You can think of that in the circumstance or the environment of of family prayers. And you have the family together and you pray together. Give us, as a family, give us as, as a family our daily bread. But you go beyond that, your horizons are broader than that, and you think of so many, particularly in the world, that wonder where their daily bread's coming from. And there are a lot of people about like that. We sometimes see them out there in the streets for some reason and they're begging. We don't know all the circumstances that have led to that and sometimes you don't know whether it's genuine or whether it's not. And there are all these complications in, 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 in that respect. But you, you know, you, you, your mind runs to many, many parts of the world and where is their daily bread coming from? Are we thoughtless and careless? I don't want to get into politics this morning, that's not my business in the pulpit, but you know, we're a greedy lot. We are a greedy lot, and as long as we've got enough for ourselves and, and overflowing lakes of milk and mountains of bread and all the rest of it, we seem to pay scant thought and concern to many people who starve across the world. And maybe we should be just a little bit more thoughtful about these things. It's a huge subject, so I'm not going to get into that this morning. However, give us this day our daily bread, and it brings a little bit of responsibility back to ourselves, perhaps. 
But then there's a spiritual sense. Give us this day our daily bread. Why do I say that? Well, as our bodies need food, so do our souls. As so is there food for the soul, there must be food for spiritual life. Isn't that what Christ meant when he spoke to Peter in John 21? You know how Peter, the apostle, denied the Lord Jesus? I don't know the man. Three times he said that in the high priest's courtyard. And then after the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ, there is the Lord with his disciples and there is the Lord with Peter in particular. And he says to Peter, feed my lambs. And then twice, feed my sheep. What did he mean by that? Was he telling Peter, I don't want you to be a fisherman anymore, I want you to be a shepherd and look after sheep. No, he's not talking about that. He's talking about his lambs, his sheep, as those who are his people. And Peter was to be someone who fed the people of God with the word of God and with spiritual ministry. Paul, in the speech he gives to the church, or the elders in particular, in Acts 20, the elders of Ephesus. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Is that about having a church lunch now and again? Is that what Paul had in mind? Obviously not. There is this idea of feeding people with spiritual truth and with the word of God. Now this is obviously important because just as without food the body weakens, so also without food the soul weakens. Spiritual life becomes weak, faith declines, love grows cold, God is edged out to the margins of our thoughts and of our lives. And as God has given us the means of obtaining our daily food, so God has also given us the means of obtaining our spiritual food. And you must think about this to, to, to give its full credit and, and its full impact of this prayer in that regard. The spiritual food picture emerges in many ways in Scripture. i just give you a couple of examples. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. The picture of a, of a young child, a baby. And the baby's got a desire, got a hunger. And the, the pains, the hunger pains kick in. And the newborn babes instinctively desire the milk that they need to grow. Now nobody's sat that child down and said, to a baby, just a few hours old even, now look, you need to understand this. You need to understand this, and I'm going to teach you a very important letter, that you need to have milk. And if you don't have milk, therefore, you're going to be in great trouble, and you won't grow. No mother ever did that. There's an instinct in the child. And God has put the instinct there. I need milk. There's not the conscious, rational thought in the mind of a, of a newborn baby or even a, a, a year old baby or whatever it might be. But there's an instinctive sense of a need and, it's, it, and that's how it works out. And that's how we should be. We should want daily bread for our souls. We should want it. And we should feel the lack of it if we don't have it. We should have those hunger pains in some degree or another. Without spiritual food, we'll never grow spiritually. Hebrews 5.12. The apostle there is talking there about the priesthood of Christ and all the, the wonderful aspects that are to be understood in the priesthood of Christ. And there's a kind of rebuke of the people there that they are not ready, they have not grown, they've not been fed enough, they've not been feeding themselves sufficiently to be ready for everything that he wants to teach them. And so he says this, When for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye ought to have advanced in your understanding, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and to become such as of need of milk and not of strong meat. So he's talking to the people there, the Hebrews there, and saying, look, 
I'm ready to give you strong meat. Things which will really strengthen you and nourish your soul and give you wonderful views of Christ and wonderful doctrines that will strengthen your faith and make you love the Lord all the more. But you're not ready for it. And you've not been feeding yourselves, evidently. And you're not stretched and you've got no appetite for these things. You're, not in, you're not in such a poor spiritual state that you can't digest strong meat. You need to go right back to the beginning and have the milk. So there's the imagery again of spiritual food. That's the point I'm trying to make at this point. So let's ask the question, do we have a spiritual appetite? Do you hunger, do you thirst for the word of God, for spiritual food? And you say, well, I'm not sure I do, to be honest. So how do you cultivate an appetite, the appetite that you ought to have? Well, let me put it to you this way. I take it that most of us, if not all of us, are used to three meals a day. That'd be right. You get up in the morning and you have some breakfast and it gets to lunchtime and... Uh, Something in you tells you, well, it's lunchtime, it's time to eat something more. And then it gets toward the evening and uh, the satisfaction of the lunch has begun to wear off, and wear off and you say to yourself, well, it's time to have something else. And it's there, isn't it? The, the, the desire, the instinct, the appetite, it's there. And why is it there? Because you're used to it. You're used to it. You're used to having your breakfast, your lunch, your evening meal. If you're used to having the Word of God you'll soon notice when you don't have it. And you will have this inbuilt desire for it that comes so much more to the fore. Cultivate then an appetite by feeding. Begin to feed yourself well on the things of God. And the aim of this, of course, is that we might have a strong spiritual life. Ordinary food for the body helps the eyesight, Helps the hearing, perhaps. And good food for the soul helps a strengthening of faith, will give us more spiritual zeal and more love for the Lord. And we need these things in order to grow. So, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day food for our souls. And how does that bread come? Well, there's bread to be obtained, we hope, through the preaching of the word. But not every day. I'm not here every day. You're not here every day. There was a time, you know, when um, the likes of John Calvin in, in Geneva, back in the early 16th century, he would be in his pulpit every morning at about 7 o'clock. And I presume he was there and there was a congregation there to hear him. I'd like to have been there. I don't know whether I'd have managed it every morning, but I don't know whether the people then managed it every morning. But there was food going from the pulpit, the preaching of the Word of God, every morning. Now, we don't live in Geneva. We live in Chichester, or thereabouts. And we don't have the advantage that the Genevans had back there in the 16th century. So how do we live spiritually? How do we feed ourselves spiritually? Well, don't try and live off one sermon every week. Don't say to yourself, well, I've been to church Sunday morning, I've had my food, and that's all I need for the week. Disastrous. Disastrous. How would you be if you had one Sunday lunch when you get home from Sunday church in the morning and you said to yourself, well, that's all, I've, I'm, I'm full up, that's it for the week. Well, you wouldn't get very far, would you? Your health wouldn't, wouldn't survive for very long and you wouldn't be able to do very much. Do we think that we can do spiritually with just listening to one 30, well, maybe more than that, 40 minute sermon? Is that enough for the week, really? Give us this day our daily bread. So what am I suggesting? You go home and you... you um, go to the internet site and you listen to the sermon every morning, well, you can do that. I'm not stopping you from doing that, but it means more than that, doesn't it? There's always bread in the Word. There's bread to be found 
in our daily devotions. Keep up your daily devotions. Develop a good reading habit. What we have available, I'm just going to mention this to you, maybe some of you don't know this, but there's a box sitting there, and upstairs in the room above, the back room that we have the prayer meeting in, there's four big bookshelves with books on. Some of those books up there may be heavy going for you, but the books in that box down there are not that heavy going. Come and borrow one. Come and have a rummage through the box and see what you can find that you think will be a help to you. Develop a good reading habit. I've got in mind to, to order some more for the church library. Accessible books, not heavyweight books that theologians like to read, but books that, I don't mean to, to, dis, to disparage anybody, but when I say this, I mean ordinary people. Ordinary people, not theologically literate people, but ordinary people can read, perhaps slowly and imbibe, and it will do you good. It will help you. But primarily, of course, it's the Word of God itself. It's the Word of God itself. Get your food from the Word. Come to the Word of God every morning, every night, and say to the Lord, give us this day our daily bread. I need food for my soul. I want to learn of you, that my praise may be better. I want to learn of Christ, that my love for him may be more. And I may be more dependent upon him and realise just what he's done and who he is for me. All of these things, daily bread for the soul, to strengthen us in every respect. Bread, of course, is most beneficial when it's digested well. That happens in the ordinary realm, doesn't it? If it's not digested, well, the body can't extract the, the nutrients, the vitamins and all the other elements that are in the, in the food. It's just there, and as the, the scriptures say, it goes in through the mouth and it passes out into the draught, and it's gone. We don't that, want that with the word of God. We want it to do us good. Don't be just an intellectual student of the Word of God and say, you know, I can remember all of the Lord's Prayer, or I can remember even all of the elements of the Sermon on the Mount, and I can recite to you Psalm 119. Anybody dare to claim that? That's not feeding. That's not learning. Not enough to understand all of the history of the Old Testament and all the rest of it and, and where Jesus went and what he did in the course of his life. That's, that can be a source of interest, but it's of no use to us unless we digest the truth. What does it mean? What does it teach us? What does it show to us of God, of Christ, and of the way of salvation? What does it do to me to strengthen me in all the trials I may have to face? How does it prepare me for future life? How does it guide me in the making of decisions through life? How does it prepare me for the day when I stand before God? That's food. And when things get tough and difficult, as they often do in life, we've got sufficient strength in our souls because we've been fed well with the nourishment of the Word of God and the Spirit of God has taken that truth and said to us, this is what it means. This is what your God is. This is who your Saviour is. Believe it. Take it to your heart. Never forget it. Live off this food for the day and it will see you through and there'll be more food for you tomorrow. And come and ask and come and receive. So many applications of this, but time has gone. Give us this day our daily bread. Feed us in our bodies, oh, but Lord, feed us in our souls. Feed us with that food that will be for our good and for the glory of Almighty God. Well, may the Lord do that by all the means that he's given to us. Amen.